having studied the two by two case, let's look at the Cayley-Hamilton theorem in general. Here, we'll state the theorem, we'll collect evidence to convince ourselves that it's true, and then we'll give the proof. So, the statement of the theorem, we'll have that F is a field, A is an N by N matrix with entries in F, we'll form the characteristic polynomial of A, so that's a determinant of lambda times the identity matrix minus A. That'll be a monic polynomial of degree N with entries in our field. If we consider this as a matrix polynomial, so I'll replace lambda with A, we'll multiply the constant term by the identity matrix. Then the Cayley-Hamilton theorem states that this matrix polynomial is equal to the zero matrix. Now, when you first see the theorem, it might seem unlikely. Okay, even now, when I work out examples, there's a small thrill when that zero comes out at the end. Okay, obvious questions are, why should a square matrix satisfy any polynomial? And if so, where does the characteristic polynomial come in? So, for the first question, let's consider the vector space of n by n matrices with entries in our field. Now, this is a vector space because we can add two square matrices together, get back a matrix of the same size, and we can scale or multiply by elements in F. Now, because we have, okay, n by n means n squared entries, that's the dimension of our vector space. So let's consider, okay, the set composed of identity matrix A, A squared, A cubed, up through A to the N squared. That set has N squared plus one elements. Since the dimension's N squared, we have a linearly dependent set. So some linear combination of these elements is equal to zero. That's just saying we have a monic polynomial in A that's equal to zero. So that answers our first question. Now, evidence for the characteristic polynomial? Well, we've already seen the two by two case, so that we were able to do by brute force. If we wanna look at more simple examples, we should consider diagonal matrices. So if we consider D equal to one, two, three, then if we form the characteristic polynomial, we're just gonna have, okay, the product of lambda minus each diagonal element. And if we replace lambda with D, what we'll have is, okay, we'll have this polynomial here, which is gonna give us the zero matrix. So we see the zero coming out pretty clearly. Another way to think of this matrix polynomial. So if we apply the characteristic polynomial to a diagonal matrix, we're just pushing that polynomial into the diagonal entries. Since they're the roots, we get zero. Now, we could use this case to prove Cayley-Hamilton when A is diagonalizable. So that means A is not necessarily diagonal, but there's a change of basis that makes it so. So we have P inverse AP is equal to some diagonal matrix D. Now here, the characteristic polynomial of A is equal to the characteristic polynomial of D. If we apply the characteristic polynomial of A to itself, we replace A with P, D, P inverse. If we take P, D, P inverse to any power, the P, P inverses collapse on the inside, leaving us with P, D to a power, P inverse. So we could pull those to the outside of the polynomial. Then I have characteristic polynomial of A is equal to the characteristic polynomial of D. So the characteristic polynomial of D applied to itself, which is zero. So it gives the Cayley-Hamilton theorem in the case where A is diagonalizable. One more special case which we use in the proof. We'll assume there's a non-zero vector V, which is cyclic under A. So that means if I take the span of V, A V is squared V, up through A to the N minus one V, we get all of our vector space back. So that means the set is a basis for our vector space, which means 
we have a linearly independent set. If we add a to the nv, we get a linearly dependent set. So that means some linear combination of these vectors and a to the nv is equal to zero, which just says can arrange to have a monic polynomial okay, of degree n in A applied to V equal to zero. We also have, by linear independence, if we take any polynomial in A with degree strictly less than n, okay, and our polynomial is not equal to zero, I apply that to V, we get something that's non-zero out. Now, first, let's show that if we apply P of A to any vector in our vector space, we get zero. So I'll choose some W. Because this is a basis, some polynomial in A applied to V is going to be equal to W. So I can apply P of A to W. And we know it because we have polynomials in A. These two matrices will commute. And then we'll be applying P of A to V, which we already know is zero. So I have P of A on W equal to zero. The choice of W is arbitrary. So that means that P of A is exactly the zero matrix. Okay, if you're not sure how that works, just remember, how do I set up the columns for a matrix? We just apply the matrix to each standard basis vector, and that tells you the linear combination of each column. So if I always get zero, each column has to be zero. Now, if we could show the characteristic polynomial of A is equal to P, we'll have Cayley Hamilton in this case. So let's write the matrix for A with respect to our basis. The recipe for setting up this matrix, I choose one of our basis elements. We apply A to it. We get a linear combination. We peel off the coefficients, and that gives us the column for our basis element. So if we apply A to V, I get AV, so I have 0, 1, and all zeros. If we apply A to AV, we have A squared V, so I have 0, 0, 1, and all zeros, and so on. So for the diagonal below the main diagonal, we'll have all ones. When I apply A to A to the n minus 1 V, we get A to the n V, and we know how to write that in terms of our basis using the polynomial P. So all I would do, I would take all terms but the leading term, push them to the other side. So all the A's pick up minus signs. The way we set up the linear combination, we'll have in the column, okay, we'll take A to the N minus one as the bottom element, put on a minus sign, and then we just work our way up. Now, this is a special kind of matrix. Okay, it's called the companion matrix for the polynomial P. So what we have is all ones on the diagonal below the main diagonal. Up the last column, we're going to have the coefficients for a polynomial P, starting with the n minus first term, put a minus sign in, and then we work our way up. Okay, and here we're assuming P is a monic polynomial. Now, what finishes our proof? We'll have that characteristic polynomial of a companion matrix is equal to the polynomial P that we use. So if we can show that, we'll have that the characteristic polynomial of A is equal to the characteristic polynomial of the companion matrix. Okay, that's because they're similar. And then that's equal to P by what we're gonna show. But we know that P of A is equal to zero by the previous board. Now, to see that the characteristic polynomial of a companion matrix is just the polynomial that we're using, that's an induction proof that I leave to you. So the main step is to note, if we take this lower n minus one by n minus one block, okay, the right hand corner, that's also a companion matrix. So that's gonna let us use our crank for induction. Let's show the proof in general. Our method is induction on the size of the matrix. So for our base case, n equal to one, a is a one by one matrix, and Cayley Hamilton is straightforward there. For our recursive step, we're gonna assume that Cayley Hamilton is true, 
when the size of our matrix is less than n. So we'll assume that A is an n by n matrix. We'll have two cases. If we can find a vector that's cyclic under A, then that's the case of our previous example, and Cayley Hamilton is true. So we'll assume that there's no cyclic vector. I'll choose any non-zero vector V in our vector space, and then we're just gonna treat it like a cyclic vector. So we're gonna consider the span of the vectors V, A V, A squared V, up through A to the K minus one V, such that this set is linearly independent, but if we throw in A to the K V, we get a linearly dependent set. Now, because our vector is not cyclic, that'll mean that K is strictly less than N. We'll call the span of these vectors subspace V. Now, by our reasoning as before, there's gonna be a monic polynomial Q with degree equal to K, such that Q of A on V is equal to zero, but if we take Q prime of A of V, that'll be non-zero whenever the degree of Q prime is less than K, and Q prime is non-zero. Now, let's take our base for V, complete it to any basis for Fn. We want to consider the matrix for A with respect to this basis. So if I apply A to any of the basis vectors for V, we know we get a linear combination in those basis vectors. So if we're going to set up the column that goes with each of these basis vectors, the coefficients for the Ws are going to be equal to zero. So for the first k columns, I'm going to have a k by k block here and all zeros beneath. Okay, and by the way this is set up, this is going to be a companion matrix. For the Ws, we don't have any information, so all I know is it'll have a block here and an n minus k by n minus k block here. We'll call that B. We can invoke the induction hypothesis. So Cayley Hamilton will apply to both blocks. So we'll have Q applied to C sub Q is zero. Okay, that's characteristic polynomial for the companion matrix. And the characteristic polynomial of B applied to B is zero. Now, let's look at the characteristic polynomial for A. Because A and U are similar, their characteristic polynomials are equal, but the characteristic polynomial of U is equal to the product of the characteristic polynomials for each diagonal block. Now, for this block it's equal to Q, for this block it's the characteristic polynomial of B. Let's apply the characteristic polynomial of A to A. Now, as with the diagonal case, since A and U are similar, there's gonna be some P that carries A over to U by conjugation. So we can rewrite this like this. And then we could take the P's to the outside. So I just wanna show that the item in the middle is equal to zero. Now, if we apply the characteristic polynomial of A to U, what we have the characteristic polynomial of A is Q times the characteristic polynomial of B. So let's take a look at what these matrices look like in block form. Here, we're just gonna apply each polynomial to the diagonal blocks, and then whatever happens off, we're not gonna worry about. And we know we'll have a zero here. So that I'll let you think about. So that means Q goes onto this block and this block. Characteristic polynomial B goes onto this block and this block. We know this block's gonna to go to a zero. This block goes to a zero. So here, we're gonna multiply like we're multiplying two by two matrices together. So the sizes of all the matrices are gonna line up correctly. That means out's gonna come the zero matrix, and that's Cayley Hamilton in the general case. It's worth noting an obvious false proof of the Cayley Hamilton theorem. So the characteristic polynomial of A is equal to the determinant of lambda I minus A. So why not substitute A for lambda? Then we have determinant A minus A, which is equal to the determinant of the zero matrix, which is equal to zero. The problem, 
This is the wrong statement for Kelly Hamilton. So what's coming out is the number zero, not the n by n matrix zero. Now the problem is the shorthand we're using here is not what we're using in Kelly Hamilton. So Kelly Hamilton is going to be using a matrix polynomial. And the notation is just that we're borrowing the coefficients from the characteristic polynomial. So remember, for the constant term, we have to multiply by the identity matrix. As a final note, here are some exercises to work out. So these are going to be cases of A where we're not diagonalizable. Now, here we have, okay, this is going to be a matrix in complex form that's not diagonalizable. This is a Jordan form, which is not diagonalizable. And then our last case, this is a companion matrix. Okay, so for this one, you should verify that the characteristic polynomial corresponds to the polynomial coming from the last column, and then that Cayley-Hamilton applies.